Hello, my name is Edward Fleckley, and welcome to the Virtualization Cloud Security Podcast episode, video episode number 15 or so and regular episode number 163 or so. I have with me um, Hugh Thompson, Dr. Hugh Thompson of Blue Coat, the CTO, and Paul Kotcher, who is the Chief Scientist and President of Cryptography Research Division of, what is it a division of? Rambus. <laughs> And I'm Edward Kletke, and welcome. We, I brought these two gentlemen together because they have been involved with the inter, integrate, um, RSA Innovation Sandbox since almost day one, right? For a I think Hugh's been with it a way. year or two more than me, but yeah, long time. Long time. And the Innovation Sandbox is one of those things that happens like the day before RSA, before the show floor opens. And it's a chance, I find, because I've been going for every year I've gone to RSA, which is the last five years, and see what's kind of new and interesting that's coming in out in the next year. That's the reason why I go as an analyst. I want to find out what's kind of fun. <laughs> this, the, the sandbox has it. This year it was packed. It was, it was standing room only for the last two years. Before that, it was like everybody could find a seat. So can you tell me why of the innovation sandbox, why it's important, and also from a contestant perspective, how do you get involved? Well, maybe I'll start with the first part of your question there. I mean, if you just step back and look at where the computer security industry is today, we're in pretty bad shape. We really, really need innovation. And you can look at this from the individual perspective, from the corporate perspective, from the government perspective. I mean, everybody's getting hacked. The systems we've got just simply aren't doing what users want. Users want systems that are actually secure in practice, and we don't have them. So we need innovation. And the question is, where is that going to come from? And it clearly doesn't seem to be coming from some of the companies that got us into the mess where we are today. Many, many of them are doing very important work. We need new ideas. And the idea of the Innovation Sandbox is to try to help companies that might have some of those new ideas or different perspectives or new approaches get some of that attention and um, awareness and connections with funding sources and potential customers that they need in order to be able to bring those technologies to market and be successful. Okay. That's a, that, I like that, and I, I see that a lot. I mean, the press buzz over this year's winner was incredible. I, they're constantly in the, in the press these days. And everybody that was there over the last couple of years has been, it's been phenomenal changes. But you had something like, there's only 10 contestants at the Innovation Sandbox. How many submissions do you guys look through before just to get to those 10? 40 million or something, I think it was. I don't remember how many videos I watched. Q, Q, do you have yeah, any? It feels that way. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. And, you, you know, it is it is fascinating. Just just kind of expanding on, on Paul's point, a lot of people, when they think about the security industry, they think, wow, you know, there's, there's some of these tool sets that have been around for a long time, and there's not a lot of innovation happening in the space in general. And one of the things that I don't think you could walk away from Innovation Sandbox not feeling is that innovation really is alive and well in the security community. I mean, the types of people that we've had come through those doors uh, over the last 11 years, unbelievable and really diverse. And everything from, you know, this year we had a company that was focused on deception technologies. You know, our winner was focused on orchestration. Last year, we had a really, really cool company that focused on badges, physical badges that changed color based on proximity. I mean, very, very interesting, incredibly diverse. And Paul's right. I mean, we, we continue to need an infusion of innovation in the space. The goal of Innovation Sandbox as a whole was to be a celebration of that. So the the contest is the cornerstone of it, and you know that's where we got the uh, jam-packed room. And we were at, at one point we were at uh, South Beach nightclub rules, right? You know somebody had to leave before somebody else could oh, get let yeah, in. It was very so, hard to get in. If you weren't in there early, forget it. You had to wait. It was really weird. It's the hot spot. What can I say? You know, Paul and I are pretty cool guys. And so <laughs> I'm getting in the room. I don't know. Sorry. Hugh, you're the MC. Paul's a asking all the tough questions. <laughs> oh, he, uh, Paul is amazing. 
at digesting this. I mean, just just think about the experience from a company standpoint. So right? go through you that experience for me. What is it? You start off by submitting and then you get like, what was it, 100 submissions, 150 this year? Yeah, I th you know, I'm not sure the exact number. Every year it's, it's, it's getting growing. not only bigger, but they're also getting more diverse. Like it, it getting yep. into the top 10 I mean, is a bloodbath. I mean, the first years we did it picking 10 meant that, you know, most of the good companies got accepted. Yep. Now there are a huge number of really, really good companies, you know, ones that smart people are investing in with different and interesting ideas that don't make that top 10. I mean, it's really, um, I mean, the amount of startup activity and innovation is increasing, which is one of the things that Innovation Sandbox, I, I don't know if it's actually driving that in any way, but I, I would like to at least pretend that it is. Um, it's, it's hugely important. We, we see it happening, and it's, it's really fun watching that. Actually, every time I consult with a security company or talk to a security company as an analyst, I find something I find that conceptually is just fascinating that I've never seen before. I say, hey, go and submit this to Innovation Sandbox for next RSA. And they go, what? Thanks. No, no, they go, what? <laughs> What's oh. this? It's like, it's a contest. You need to be involved in it. it. I mean, it's a huge amount of free publicity for the 10 companies that make it. And obviously the one that wins gets a whole lot more on top of that. So, I mean, like for our companies, it's, um, you know, there's no downside at all other than that you're going to be asked hard questions and you'll be up against some really tough comp competition, but it's a great way to get exposure for startups. And I think their number of submissions reflects that the startup community is recognizing that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. I totally agree with Paul. And it's, it's you know, Edward, getting back to your question about the experience for, for somebody that gets selected. First of all, these companies are ecstatic to be in the top 10 because they know what that means. They know what a rarefied atmosphere that that is. But then you, know, you think about the actual day. So you've got thousands of people out in the audience. You've got three minutes, a clock in front of you that is counting down 24 style, right? I mean, it's with the red lights and you can see it go down. The audience has a copy of that clock behind them so they can watch you watch your own clock countdown. So it adds this element of danger. Um, in, in the mix too. And in that three minutes, you have to talk about what your company does, your management team, how are you going to go to market, all of these things that you probably poured your heart and soul into over the last couple of years. And then you get- but Then the hard part starts. <laughs> then the hard part starts, exactly, right? And you know, Paul, Paul, Paul has been a judge on, on this thing forever, you know, just, just my two cents, say he's one of the smartest guys in this industry, right? And it's, it's pretty scary when you do that three minutes and then Paul's like, I have a question, right? That's, that to me, that would be the scariest, you know, a couple of words that you could, you could see. But that's what happens. I mean, there's, you know, one year it was two minutes. This year, I think it was three minutes that we allowed for, for Q&A. But that can feel like the longest two or three minutes of your life. I mean, very incisive questions. Uh, it's 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 a great spectator sport on the one on the one oh, hand. It's a but it, fun. It's a, yeah, it's, 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 I mean, it's a huge amount of fun. And on the other hand, like Paul said, what an incredible exposure opportunity. It is for these companies. They get a booth. There's thousands of people there interested. So I mean, while we wait for you to catch up. Okay, in a, in a very, very good way. So we have a slight. And as a judge, you know, it's the video catch up here. Okay, I think it's caught up. <laughs> and, and as a judge, I mean, I also want to ask the questions that I hope audience members would ask if somebody was trying to sell them the product that's being described. So we talk about asking hard questions and, you know, the most difficult pointed question I can come up with is what I want to ask there. because. People who are buying in this industry need to be asking tougher questions because they're buying stuff that isn't working. And what can we do to push vendors to do a better job? So I view it also as an education opportunity for that thousand plus people who are watching this process go on. Well, it's a thousand in the room or so, but there's like thousands watching online, too. I mean, this is this is big stuff now. 
it's a lot of free press. It's really cool. I mean, being in the audience for the last five years, uh, my experience is a little bit different than theirs. I mean, I'm watching the time, time click down. It's like every, it's like what, three people missed their ending this year. Last year it was a couple, a couple, and it's like you you get down to the end. And it's like a rush of words. It's like I don't understand any of that. <laughs> what what did you just say? And then you guys ask your questions like, okay, is that the question I want to ask? So you, you asked, and it was an, a very interesting concept I thought was the whole RF identity. You know, and that actually is now tying into federal law and a, and a number of different crunch, countries and privacy. And the question was asked about that. And the answer was to me, was, I mean, there's some answers that are good and some answers that are, we're still thinking about it, which is still a valid answer. If they're still thinking, but I'm glad, because it means there's a lot more to think about there. Um, it was a very interesting set of questions that got asked for, of that particular customer, and there's a, a bunch of questions about got asked about the, the people with the, the ID that flashed and stuff. And they were on the show floor this year, doing very well. So on the real show floor, so that was actually kind of fun. Um, there's a lot going on here, and then you get a chance as an audience member to go visit the 10 booths. You just go one, boom, 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 boom. And you just sit there and, I mean, you can just sit there and listen to the questions getting asked by the audience. And somehow the judges are asking questions there too. You guys get a chance to wander around, is right. And we also have a chance beforehand to read up on the company. So we're not walking in, you know, wow. we've gone through a process of first filtering out the huge number of submissions to pick those. And then we do extra work homework in advance on those companies. Um, but it's fun and it's, it's exposure that a company, you know, money couldn't buy that exposure and um, and they don't have to pay for it. So if you were, if I were running a startup, it would be a, a high priority for me to try to try to get in there. Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, it's interesting too, if you look at the perspectives of the judges, one of the things that we've tried to set up is that you'd have the perspective of somebody who's been in that person's shoes and been incredibly successful. So Paul, in addition to breaking Daz and you know forcing everybody to move uh, from that algorithm <laughs> to other ones, uh, so being a brilliant cryptographer, very, very successful entrepreneur. And so there's that viewpoint, right, which is very technical, but also, you know, is this person going to make it kind of questions. <laughs> All the judges are really just people with interesting and different backgrounds from. Absolutely. Absolutely. We've got then buyers, right? So people who would be potential buyers of the solutions, incredibly smart folks from the CISO community, like Renee Gutman is one of the judges, for example. Uh, and she's been at multiple organizations. She was at Coca-Cola. Um, she's a Royal Caribbean now. You know, so she would be, hey, look, would I buy this thing? Right? Would I consider buying that? So there's that that perspective represented. I think Patrick gives that same perspective too from Dropbox. There's also the interesting perspective of from an investor. So Ashim Chadna, who's on the judging board too, he's he's been there literally, I think maybe since the first one. And he also asks these very incisive, hey, would I get behind a place like this? So is this a place that I could put my money and it be a safe haven? So we get proxies in essence for all these. It would be questions if they were sitting in those chairs. And you, you get a really, a really good 360 degree view of the company, I think, based on those questions. Well, the other thing you get, which is really interesting to me as well, is that at, when the judges go off and you say, hey, the judges are going to spend some time, we don't know what type of battles are going on in, with the judges. I'm going to ask you that in a second. But then you bring on, actually, the last couple of times, I don't know what you did this year because I had to step out, take a phone call, and come back in. But um, the last couple you did was you had some of the investors come in. You had Microsoft come on stage talking to EMC about what they would invest in, how to get their attention. That's actually very valuable, too, to anybody trying to do a startup because money's tight. You know. Yes, yeah, I'll, 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 I
uh, I'll leave I'll leave the dangers of the judging room to Paul to uh, to talk about. Um, but just just in terms of some of the other content that we try and bring into that mix, this year we had uh, it was great. We had TechCrunch as a media partner, and there was an interview uh, with Enrique Salem. So Enrique was a former a CEO of Symantec, so had that perspective of running very large yep. security company but is now an investor, right? And that's what he does every day, is look at companies like this and makes big bets on those companies. And uh, the point of that discussion, which I think went off really well, what is the funding climate like? What do you look for when you make the decision of, am I gonna invest in the A round for this particular company? What are the qualities? How does that market look like it's going to evolve over the next year, for example? Talk about changes, talk about criteria. So we really try and service folks who are in the audience, not just that might be looking to bring in new technologies to solve problems, but also people that might be working inside companies today and have a great idea like, man, how, how would I ever get started in turning this idea into a company? So that's the stuff that happens in between. Now, while that's happening, the judging room is going down. And I'll turn it over to Paul to uh, give Paul, some insight. So every time we come out and, and Hugh says this has been the toughest judging year, is it really that? Is it? Have you made up your minds before going in there or is it really a lot of give and take? It's a lot of give and take. I mean, there's there's never been a year where I've done this where it's been just a slam dunk that one company in all the different ways you could look at it was the best. And part of it is there's different perspectives. There's the question of, you know, how innovative is this? What's the market look like? Is this a team that we think will actually be successful as a company? What is the impact of the technology? You look at these different angles. And it's also kind of like trying to pick your favorite dessert. I mean, different people have different opinions. They all look really good. I mean, there might be that one that has like that, you know, thing on top that you really don't like and everybody kind of agrees they shouldn't be the one. Um, but usually we've ended up, you know, often removing a couple fairly quickly from the contention. And then we just try to work through it. And there are often different people who have really strong and valid opinions amongst the judges that, about who it should be. Um, one year we ended up with a runner up because we couldn't say no to a company, but we, and there was another one that we felt like should be the number, the winner. And, um, so it, it's, it's always a really hard process and it reflects also just the quality of the number of companies that are innovating in the security space. I mean, if you had to say, you know, pick the best technology startup generally, it'd be really hard to do. There's some really great Absolutely. technology companies and securities a little narrower than all of technology, but actually not that much narrower. In fact, if you look at the problems that we have in the technology industry going forward, security is really on the top of the list. It's a problem that gets worse and worse as systems scale and get bigger, where, and the technology industry has already scaled far beyond the point that we really know how to deal with the security problems. So we're going to be seeing, I think in the future, more high quality companies here that are even more important tackling these giant issues that we face. So um, I don't expect ever to really come before that room and say, oh, it was easy. We had one great company and the other nine just weren't there. <laughs> so is, this, is it a secret ballot or a show of hands? It involves everything short of physical violence, basically. You know, okay. we have- we And that's not well, necessarily we, off the table. <laughs> in, lots, in lots of coffee, I imagine. Um, you know, debate, we'll, we'll, we've done, you know, write down on a piece of paper. It's a fun conversation. And um, it, it's, it's a uh, one where there isn't a right answer, but we're trying to trying to do our best. One of these days, I would love to be a fly on the wall in one of those conversations, but I would have to be a judge to do that. So um, well, you could be a bodyguard or uh, we can we can find a role maybe for a <laughs> <laughs> fly on the wall. That's what my role is. I'll, referee. Uh, referee. <laughs> yeah, you probably need one sometimes. Call you for some physical fouls, you know. Right. <laughs> well, you, I could imagine doing the judging and ruling, doing a, a, a running dialogue for color. <laughs> a color commentary as the judging goes on where you're not revealing anything except for, you know, 
what's happening physically. That would be incredibly funny. I think the RSA conference is then we need to pick the object. It's all good. We're all friends. Yeah. And so, and the other thing is, uh, when you think about it, th in the last three or four years, every vendor in the top 10, there hasn't been two alike. I mean... Well, and that's intentional. I mean, well, when I we're looking that. through... I mean, there are some areas that get hot every year. You know, for I me, mean, for example, this year, there were a lot of companies that were looking at taking basically analytic data and throwing onto it quite, quote, quote, unquote, big data and machine learning to try to get insights from the log data that's collected. So that's a space that's really crowded right now, yes. whereas like last year, Tick2 with their badge technology, I mean, that was just totally out of left field. There wasn't any, but it's not like, oh, that's another one of those companies. It's, it's totally unique. So, I mean, and I love those unique companies. I mean, I think they're also the ones that in some ways have the greatest disruptive potential. So um, through the first stage as well as the second, I mean, trying to find something that really is different and innovative is a big part of what we're trying to do. Um, and, you know, recognizing that those kinds of companies might have leadership teams that are coming farther from left to field or have um, maybe some bigger challenges, but also bigger rewards if they're successful. So. Um, certainly companies that have new perspectives are the ones that I most enjoy thinking about and talking to and, and learning about. The same here. I mean, when I'm in the, in the room listening to everybody, it's like some of the really left fields. I like Tick2, too, just because it was unique. I'm always You always have one from left field that doesn't fit. Like, is this like, really? There's always one from way out in left field that's in the room and, and does a good job. No one up there does a bad job. And they, how much coaching do they get to to do that three minute presentation? Let's start. Yeah, there. yeah. You know that's that's interesting. That part has evolved quite a bit over the last eleven years. So if you went back and you watched presentations from maybe five years ago, it was, "Hey guys, congratulations! You're in the top ten. You're going to do a three minute presentation. Look forward to seeing you on Monday." You know, <laughs> come early and 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 there was high variability, I would say, I in those presentations. <laughs> um, so, some were fantastic and just really polished right on time, all of that. And then there's some that were kind of completely meandering, didn't didn't even touch on who was going to run it or touch on how they would ever sell it or you know those kinds of things. Now we have a process in place where there are multiple calls leading up to the actual event and folks on those calls essentially rehearse and go through those, those three minute pitches. And then we also have on-site rehearsals where they go, they have the three minutes, they see what the experience is like. And I think the results have been pretty great over these last, uh, last few years years. I mean, Paul, it'd be great to get your perspective, but it, it seems like, you know, I can't think of anybody that did a bad job this year. I mean, they all were articulate, you know, they had a, a great way of presenting what they do. And I think they represented fairly well the, the company, but yeah, that part's evolved quite a bit. Well, and being under fire is part of the security industry. So we've got people that are. Absolutely. That. So, and we, you know, presentations do vary, but um, I thought they were, everybody this year did a fantastic job. And um, it's partly the conference, but also just reflects, again, I think the quality of the companies that are making the top 10. Um, I mean, there's, there were many companies that didn't make the top 10 that would have been great up there also. And yep. that's makes it easy to pick 10 really high quality companies when you've got that level of, of entrance. So now that it's grown, I mean, it really has over five years, it's been a massive growth. I mean, just five years. I mean, you go back 11 years, it's probably been even bigger than this. But now that it's getting much more polished and much more, I mean, are you thinking about doing like a more than just a number one, a runner up all the time? Or is that just kind of whenever whatever happens, happens? Yeah, that's 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 a tough one because you know I think I think now people have really embraced that format, right? Which yeah. is 
high stress, high pressure. There's a winner at the end. But honestly, and we really try and and push this through even on the day and you know, on the press release that all 10 of these folks are winners. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to get into that top 10. And to Paul's point, even a company that submitted that didn't get picked, there's such great companies out there now that a number 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, those would have been great entrants as well, right? So we try, we try and frame it up so that those top 10, it really means something to get into that group. Yes. And there is a winner, but that doesn't mean that all of these other folks aren't going to be incredibly successful as well. I'd say in terms of expanding, you know, one big expansion that we did do is change Innovation Sandbox so it's not just that event that's on Monday, but create then the Sandbox which is an experience that goes through the entire conference. And there's content there that's meant to get people thinking differently and creatively and, and celebrate innovation. So we had things on IoT vulnerabilities and you know, se sessions like that that were all through the week that was to continue on the spirit of innovation. So I think, I think we'll continue to go down that path. In terms of the format, I don't know. I mean, we've just got the next time. We've got this. Next time, use yeah. the keynote room. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't like the nightclub rules. You don't like that one goes it's, in and other comes. Yeah, yeah. Next time, almost everybody was there, so wanted to be there. So next time, use the keynote room so you get all 30, 40,000 people in the room. Want to interactive too, and and the keynote yeah. room is the least interactive. Kind of <laughs> stuff. I, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. It's true. They did have a lot. I mean, I mean, how many are you on the booths? Are you limited to the number of people you can actually bring to the to the room? Or is it unlimited? You mean, you mean in fire terms code? Of, no, no, yeah. no, I'm not talking about <laughs> I'm not talking about audience. I'm talking about the, the top 10. Are they told they need to bring a certain number of people or you just give them a max number? So it's like, oh, you can only have four people there. No, there's not there's not guidance like that around how many people that they can bring to be around their booth, for example. Um, but I haven't seen any abuses of that, you know, so no no swarm of like 180 people from company A all in shirts surrounding everybody else's. But there's there's you know, the, the spirit of this thing has actually kind of been quite good. So, sure. so yeah, some of these companies like don't have 180 employees. So, yeah, it wants to get in companies. I mean, the goal is to give exposure to companies earlier in their lifespan. So, companies that have great idea and a couple of good people. I mean, that's the level that um, you can compete and win this thing with. And a number of companies have been quite early on and then done great things afterwards. So, we want to be the you know helping those companies up, not picking somebody who's already figured it all out. I'm not sure many of the companies have figured it all out. That's why all this other information you guys give during the, is invaluable. So I have one question. How do you get involved? I mean, if you want to be part of this, what do they have to do? They have to wait for something to show up? Should they start planning now? I mean, RSA is done. We're now looking forward to next year. What's the what, what do people should be looking at? Well, first, come up with an absolutely brilliant new innovation that solves a huge swath of the world security problems. World peace, yes. <laughs> Create a company and then go on the RSA website and submit. I don't actually know what the exact submission deadline is, but make sure you don't miss the deadline. Um, and through that, you need to make a short video describing what you've done and, and fill in some information about the company. And that's the first stage. Um, the judges look at every single thing the submitters provide, um, every single video. Um, I watched, I don't know how many of those last year, um, and go from there. I mean, it's, it's not a hard process, although it does require really understanding what's different about what you're doing from both, from particularly a technical level, you know, what is that innovative thing that sets you apart and expressing that in a way that the judges can understand and the customers can understand. Okay. You know, you know, one, one, one thing I'd say uh, on that, so everything Paul said, you know, we, we will have an open call 
call for companies and innovative companies that happens kind of near the end of this year. Um, so look out for that. But it, it's interesting. I mean, the feedback that we've gotten almost universally, not just from the people that have made the top 10, but from people that have entered and maybe not even made the top 10, that the process of having to edit what they do down into this bite-sized nugget that is one of the things that we require, which is a very concise video that Paul mentioned, that that process was so valuable to them. In fact, you'll, you would see a high correlation between that video that got created for this process then being a prime asset for that company going forward in the future. It shows up on their website. It's what they use to articulate their message. It's an amazing forcing function to have you sit down and really think, what would I succinctly communicate about my company out to a third party? And I think just the process itself is pretty valuable. Oh, I would agree with you there. I mean, anybody runs a business, we have to think about you know our messaging all the time and whether or not it's concise enough, whether or not it's the right message. And I think that's, a, that's if you're gonna do it, do it now. You said the um, call for action will happen sometime around November, December of this year for next year. Yep, yep, that's right. Yeah, I don't have the exact dates. I don't think we've set the exact dates yet, but it will be, yeah, right right around that time frame. So people, companies that are looking forward to doing this or want to do this, you have to have a product available by when? Yeah, so I think, and, and Paul, correct me on this if I'm wrong, because we've, we've changed it a little bit, but I think you have to, one of the criteria is you have to have had a new product introduced in the marketplace within the last year. So basically, there has to be a new product that is in the marketplace. And then we have restrictions on size of the company in terms of revenue and things like that to do exactly what Paul said. We don't want you know, big security companies showing up at this thing. We want the people that really are new. Apple and, and Microsoft are not supposed to be the right, startup yeah. here. Apple now to present, you know, I think this iPhone is going to catch on. Let me come and, you know. Yeah, right. so it's not, it's not going to be those folks. I love it. Great work. It's just that's not the forum for them. They can okay. they can afford to pay for their own yeah. PR if you're Apple. OK, so do the re re if you're going to be doing this, have a product available like mid year or, or, something or a like service that. or, or a, service. I mean, okay. a thing that you can offer. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a physical object. Well, one year you had somebody that on in the top 10 that was they did a um, there's, they actually had a service platform, not a security platform. It was a service platform to provide the information for doing incident response, which I found fascinating. It's like, here's the process, yeah. and you can edit it to be whatever you want, and that's just the process for doing in incident response. We don't do it. <laughs> We're just providing you the knowledge for doing it. Yeah, and, now, and, and you know what's, what's so interesting? I mean, uh, the company that you mentioned exited within the last six months. And if you go back and you look at uh, the track record of the conference, the people that would have walked through that doors in the whole top 10, not just the winners, you'll see an unbelievable amount of IPOs, exit to big companies. Yep. It really yep. is a very, very neat thing to see it now that we've been doing it so long to see those things actually happen and mature. I actually remember one company that exited the day after. <laughs> oh, well, to an average, but... The little it's, average, they uh, actually got bought by one, they got bought the day after they won. It was very interesting. <laughs> wow, and, you know, is Even companies that fail in interesting ways can also be successful from a broader perspective. I mean, this is about innovation and not, I mean, not every innovation will make money, some will get used in different ways. So, well, we've had an incredible track record and I think we will continue to do so. I also want to see companies, you know, being innovative is the most important thing and having a company that will have an impact um, is what we're looking for. And that usually correlates to financial success as well, but um, trying to find the people that are going in a different direction is really what this is all about. Okay, so if you have yet unique product, a very innovative approach, service, 
product, whatever, sign up when it's available. When the call to action comes out, hit the RSA site, find the Innovation Sandbox. It'll be right on the homepage somewhere. Click on it and submit. It's, yeah. wor it's worth your time. It really is. Totally. As an audience we, member, me as an audience member, I've enjoyed it. I've found new things. The conversations are always incredible. Listening to the judges ask their questions and the answers that come back, I always found that I find that very very interesting. It's, it's, well, and we need innovation here. I mean, the, the the things that the technology industry can't solve because of security problems is already a large set of issues, and that number of issues is going to grow. So the more we can deal with these security problems, the more benefits we can give to society, the better we can tackle these challenges that we have lying ahead of us. So um, the broadest level, I mean, the innovation here is going to be making the difference between solving critical problems for people and having the technology industry really not be able to deal with problems we could otherwise address. So hugely important um, to get this innovation. And if, if people have good ideas, you know, this, this is one of the many tools available to try to help bring those to market and get them deployed. And, and you know, just 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 to, to add kind of a, a final thought on top of what um, you, you know what Paul said, one thing we, we really hope will happen, and I really think it has happened. We haven't gone back and tracked the statistics of it, but there will be people who are sitting in that audience that work for a company, maybe you know who knows what their title is. They're in security ops, and they run a set of tools tools or techniques or technologies, and they have a great idea for a better mousetrap, right? We want those people to look at the folks that are on stage. And if you think about the background of many of them, it's folks that were in that exact same position and had a great idea and were very passionate about it. As Paul says, we need those people to not listen to the folks that will give them a thousand reasons why this is not going to work and why you shouldn't go off and start a business. We need for those folks to embrace their inner entrepreneur and go out and really explore that idea and bring it into the market. That's where some of the best ideas come from. You also, at one of the innovations, it, uh, at one of the innovation sandbox that we will encourage those people to act. Okay. No, I agree. You, if you have the idea, run with it. It's, it's, it's not going to hurt you. <laughs> it only hurt a little bit. <laughs> Actually, it won't hurt at all. Just run with it. Write it down at the very least. Right. Write it down. Think about it. Add more to it. I mean, I have a running list of security ideas that I want to put together when I have like that. There you go. Months. There you go. Yeah. All I, right. We will see your submission next year. I'm looking forward Let's to see it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in that business, but um, yeah, so it would be very good. I actually started writing down these ideas years and years ago. Um, I actually still have a few of them on paper, no less. Um, when you have these ideas, write them down, think about them, and see if anybody else is doing anything like them. A lot of my ideas have actually been implemented. And not for me talking to them, it's just similar people having those same ideas over and over again. It's like, oh, I got that, I wanna solve that, so they do. It won't hurt to write them down. And if you find no one's doing it, go off and write a proof of concept. It's, that should not be that hard. And when you get that- And also thinking about the problems that we're going to have. I mean, we're gonna have technical systems that are much more complex than the ones we have now. We're gonna have cars driving people around where the people don't even know where they're going. We're going to be having, you know, um, cities and infrastructure that are going to be online and connected and talking and with software that's 50 years old in it that when 50 years have passed. Well, what's going to happen? How are we going to deal with these problems? These problems are ones we have to live with as a society. We're creating them right now. Um, we can see the problems, but we need some innovation to fix them. So whether it's you know, anybody who's, who's listening to this, who has that idea, you know, if it, talk to people, figure out if your idea really is good enough to start a company. And if you think it is, go for it and submit here. And you know, this is one of many tools available as a really vibrant venture community, especially in the Bay Area and in Israel around investing in security startups. But no matter where you are on the planet, you know, reach out to people. Um, reach out we to need people. these ideas. 
and go and visit the innovation sandbox and reach out and just talk to some of the folks that are even listening in the audience or maybe even go up to i mean is it possible for i mean they're hard to get a hold of but if someone had an idea and wanted to bounce something off of somebody where would be a good spot to do that email hugh uh, or, or <laughs> <laughs> thanks paul thank you for, <laughs> thank you, you know, for all you might not get a response if you email somebody who's really busy, but you know, talk to people. It's a big industry. There are tens of thousands of people at RSA of all kinds of different knowledge. But if you talk to 20 people there and have 20 conversations, from those you'll get 20 perspectives. And you know, as you have those conversations, people know people. You'll you'll. It's it's not a hard community to navigate, um, and it doesn't mean that everybody's perception of their own idea is going to equal somebody else's. I mean, there are certainly people who I think their ideas aren't going to succeed and they think they will. And sometimes I'm wrong. Sometimes I'm right. I don't know. We have different, different perspectives there. So don't take it personally if somebody isn't excited about what you're doing. But there certainly is a lot of investment looking at it, trying to solve these problems. And I mean, if you talk to customers about what they're going through on the security front right now, it's pretty awful. We have, you could really make the argument that computer security at this point is a failed industry in terms of delivering what customers want. And any kind of a technology that has a positive cost benefit associated with it, customers want to buy those. There's a real market. So um, it's a great place to innovate. It's been an industry that's been fantastic for me and I know for Hugh as well. Um, so and it's one where, so, yes. you know, it's, it's not like you know, most industries where the cheapest product is what people are going to buy because they're all the same. It's not like paper cups where you know it's going to hold water. We've got products that you know people claim are secure and aren't. We're kind of back where medicine was in about, I don't know, 1850 maybe. You know, kind of all kinds of crazy stuff being sold and lots of innovation potential. So it's exciting. Also, pay attention to the bad guys. I mean, look at what they're doing to hack the systems and see if you can prevent those. That'd be a good way to start. If you come up with this great idea, is that something for, I mean, I look at it this way. There's things that can prevent, there's things that can monitor, there's things that can alert, and there's things that can analyze. Where do you fit? Find where you fit in, as well, because that's going to help you define who you want to bounce ideas off of. Or find a new category beyond those. I mean, that, oh, that's absolutely. What it is. Yeah. yeah. Come up with something brand new. But also pay attention to what's also out there because it may have already been done and tried and failed. Figure out why it failed and learn from those mm -hmm. mistakes and go on and, and overcome those. I think that would be a great way to go forward, too. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, like, like Paul said, we are a, a very young industry. Security in general is a young industry. If you compare it to a field like medicine, for example, True. and because, because of that, there's still a lot of intellectual ground to cover in terms of processes, methods, categories of tools. And it is neat to be inside of an industry where you could innovate on some Adopted. I mean, my favorite personal examples is the CAPTCHA, right? The squiggly lines that everybody hates to type in and that you could hardly read yourself and figure out what they are. But that went from somebody's PhD thesis into being implemented in most websites uh, in the world within a couple of years. Yeah. Right? And think of how disruptive that was in the hacker community that had all these scripts that did these brute forcing username and password attacks. It is just, to me, things like that are so inspirational. It's somebody who had a really interesting idea, it then got virally adopted and changed things. And we're in an industry that will continue to change. There's smart people on the attacker side as well as on the innovator side which means that it's a really cool industry to be a part of, but there's always going to be opportunity to innovate. So it's also in a much more dynamic industry than even medicine, which is an area of huge innovation. I mean, because the systems that we're trying to secure keep getting exponentially more complicated. I mean, sort of like yes. in medicine, your patients got twice as fat every year and you were trying to like cope with that. I mean, you'd have the things that work at one level of scaling don't work a couple levels beyond. So the things that we're needing to deal with this crisis even if you know somebody had a magic technology that, that solved 90% of today's problem, 
in just a few years, the problem would have scaled to a whole new dimension. So um, for as long as that exists, um, we have this extra need and opportunity and driver um, for innovation to help tackle these issues. It's almost like we're back in the 1850s where our doctors were just learning to wash their hands before performing surgery. You yeah. Know, that's what security is like today. People still have to wash their hands before they go and touch anything, but they're and, not. And, our, and as an industry, our patients' outcomes right now are terrible. Yes. I mean, you just read in the newspaper what's going on, and um, we have to change that. Now, it's also important to view the problems in the context of the benefits. You know, most of us aren't going and switching back to manual typewriters and carrier pigeons and you know, letters delivered on horseback because the benefits are still outweighing the, the risks, but we need to be able to manage those risks in order for the industry to keep scaling. I agree. I would agree. Well, gentlemen, I, 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 I slightly disagree in the fact that I do enjoy carrier pigeons, but other than that, I agree. <laughs> but do you have a carrier pigeon farm? I plan to, not currently, but it's, 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 it's in the future. <laughs> I collect old crypto gear, and one of the things I have is a manual for how to operate your crypto equipment from the Army from the 1920s. It describes how to use the cipher wheels and how to take care of the pigeons. So you joke, oh, but oh. there was a time when these jobs were <laughs> were were handled by the same people. Yeah. E email me after, man. I, I may need that. So I think it's the PG-84 is the Army name for the capsule you strap to the pigeon's leg with your message in it. Let me, let me make a note of that. <laughs> that could be the new innovation, a better carrier pigeon capsule for uh, secure messaging. Why not? Carrier pigeon encryption, you know, it's all done by whatever. It's what comes in, goes out some end. <laughs> um, so what the other thing is, so I, I gather, Paul, you have an enigma in your office, though. Uh, I've actually got a, two enigma machines. I'm, I'm a bit of a... I'm really interested in the old stories in part because the mechanical engineering behind doing calculations with just moving parts and no transistors is fascinating to oh, me. Analog, and yeah. also history. I mean, people died because of these machines, successes and failures and their overconfidence in the designs. So they're the history aspect is a mechanical engineering aspect. They're just really physically neat objects with a story and a lesson that often we can are tempted to forget whether it's hubris or innovation behind each one of them. Um, there was a guy with the last name Hoglin who was the first sort of major entrepreneur in the, in the cryptography space. Um, I think he was the first millionaire um, crypto entrepreneur and his machines are all really neat to look at. I mean, you, you can find some of his even on eBay, like the M209 that was the US sort of workhorse design in the World War II. Um, they're just really neat stuff, and there's there um, we are part of a very long history that stretches back to you know several thousand years, and we'll yes. go forward and trying to figure out what that future can look like is uh, one of the most exciting parts of my job and um, about programs like the Innovation Sandbox. Well, the thing about this way, encryption's been done for six thousand plus years. I mean, we know that for a fact. So. When you think about languages, there's an encrypted form of almost every language out there, which is really fun. Um, but also, you know, if you have that idea, you may be the next Stephen Turing. You may create the next Bond, even though everybody else said, no, it will never work. It may. Go for it. Right, or the, or the person that figures out how to build the cipher machine that doesn't get broken. Now, the problems that we faced when those mechanical machines like the M209 or the Enigma were, were, were built was one around getting enough computation. Yeah. We have a different problem now, which is we have too much computation. You have no idea what's going on in your computer anymore, whereas you had a pretty good idea what was going on inside your Enigma machine if you were, if you were operating one. So there's some differences in terms of sort of shifting from having too little to too much and how we have to take different perspectives to deal with that. But um, regardless of what the problem is, when you've got a big problem, you need innovation to solve it. And I agree with that. Well, final thoughts, gentlemen? 
Yeah, what well, you know, just uh, just to say thanks for spending the time on this. Uh, I think uh, I think it is a noble cause. I think you'll you'll find that if you look at, at both Paul's and, and my history, we're big fans of innovation and pushing it uh, ourselves. Uh, and it's uh, it's really neat to be a part of this program and just see it grow the way that it's grown. And uh, I hope to see everybody who's watching this. I'm going to zoom in real close. <laughs> Be there next year. Uh, yeah, watch it, submit. You know, if you've got an idea that can change the world, don't don't leave it on your scrap of paper. Go act on it. You know, go talk to investors. Go take a risk and um, you know, help us change the world. We need, we need we need people with innovations. And I'm going to leave it at that. Other than to say, look for November, December to do the call to action. If you have a new product and you think it's innovative, submit. It won't hurt, just a little bit. But, you know, just making up that three-minute thing may be painful, but it's worth doing. Wait for the Innovation Sandbox. We'll be at next RSA conference. Look for it. It's a, it's a great, little, great little show within a show. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye.